Hierbij heb je open this academic ceremony in which Felipe Villaca Cavalleri Machado will defend the academic thesis Body Composition Abnormalities in Chronic Respiratory Disease. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Dear Mr. Proactor, dear members of the Corona, dear family, friends and audience, welcome to the public defense of my dissertation. Today, I have a special opportunity to give you a brief overview of the work that I have done on the uh, past few years. The central topic of my PhD thesis are body composition abnormalities in chronic respiratory disease. Chronic respiratory disease are long lasting conditions that primarily affect the airways and other lung structures. We should be aware of the high prevalence of chronic respiratory disease in the world. Estimates indicate that more than 500 million individuals in the world were living with chronic respiratory disease in 2017. This corresponds to 7.4% of the world's population. And chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is the most prevalent chronic respiratory disease in the world, accounting for around 55% of the total cases, or even more if we consider only people older than 40 years old. COPD, the diagnosis of COPD requires the presence of persistent airflow limitation in a patient with appropriate symptoms and exposure to risk factors. An interesting fact about this disease is that COPD is an heterogeneous disease. It's not unusual that in the same rehabilitation center you may see patients with different pulmonary and extrapulmonary characteristics. For instance, some of these patients may have low muscle mass, which is one of the main determinants of sarcopenia, a progressive and generalized skeletal muscle disorder associated with increased likelihood of adverse outcomes and mortality. On the other hand, some of the patients may present an excessive fat accumulation, which can be classified as overweight and obesity when this is associated with any risk to health. You may already know, but if not, keep in mind that these problems do not always occur apart from each other. In fact, over the last few years, there has been increasing interest on studying sarcopenic obesity, which can be defined as the coexistent the coexistence between these two problems. But we need more evidence to determine how common are these problems in patients with chronic respiratory disease. We also need a better understanding of the magnitude of the problem. In other words, what's the clinical relevance of these problems for this population? And by answer to these two questions or exploring these two questions, we hope to contribute to revealing a few factors that are associated with body composition abnormalities in patients with chronic respiratory disease. Therefore, the main aim of my thesis was to expand the existing knowledge on the frequency and impact of body composition abnormalities in patients with chronic respiratory disease. We had the opportunity to explore this aim not only in patients with COPD, but also in patients with other common Condi respiratory conditions such as asthma and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is of a great interest since most of the research uh, had focused most in patients with COPD. And in addition, we had the opportunity to compare longitudinal changes in body composition between patients with COPD, smoking and non-smoking controls. I would like to start by showing the main results of a retrospective study with patients with COPD recruited during the initial evaluation for admission in a physical training problem, program in two study centers located at Londrina, Brazil. Most of the patients were enrolled at the University Hospital of Londrina, while the remaining patients were enrolled at the Pythagoras Unopar University. Data from 207 patients were analyzed. The mean age of the sample was 67 years. The most of the sample was male, and as a group, they presented moderate airflow limitation. 
we found that in the sample, 39% of the patients could be classified as normal body composition since they show with appropriate levels of muscle mass and fat mass. 13% of the patients could be classified as obese since they presented a high amount of fat mass. 21% of the patients were classified as sarcopenic since they presented low levels of muscle mass. And the remaining 27% of the patients were classified as sarcopenic obesity since they presented a combination between low muscle mass and high fat mass. In this study, the functional exercise capacity was assessed by the 6-minute walking test. Our findings demonstrate the clinical relevance of body composition abnormalities in COPD since, in comparison to the normal body composition group, the sarcopenic and the sarcopenic obese groups were 7.8 and 9.5 times more likely to walk less than 350 meters. And we know from previous study from previous studies that a patient with this reduced exercise capacity are at an increased risk of death in the following years. Now I would like to show you the main results of a retrospective study with patients with asthma that were referred to a pulmonary rehabilitation assessment at CIRO in the Netherlands. These patients were diagnosed by a respiratory physician uh, based on international criteria and were in a clinically stable phase. In total, data from 687 patients were analyzed. The mean age of the sample was 58 years, the majority of the sample was female, and the FEV1 was 76% of predicted. In this study, we found that one in every five patients with asthma referred to pulmonary rehabilitation demonstrates low muscle mass. The functional exercise capacity was also assessed by the six-minute walking test in this study. We can see that asthmatic patients with normal weight and normal muscle mass had the best exercise capacity. In comparison to this group, the patients with low muscle mass presented reduced exercise capacity. And moreover, the patients in the obese group with normal muscle mass also presented a reduced exer lower exercise capacity compared to this group. In this study, the quadriceps muscle strength was assessed by an isocinetic dynamometer. We can see that the normal weight and normal muscle mass group was not necessarily the strongest group. However, Patients with low muscle mass present low muscle strength as long as they are compared with patients with similar BMI. We also had the opportunity to study the body composition of patients with IPF. This is a rare condition compared to COPD and asthma with a no case, unpredictable clinical course and high mortality. We analyzed the data from patients with a confirmed diagnosis of IPF and uh, referred to a specialized rehabilitation center in Germany. A total of 98 patients were included. The mean age of the sample was 60 years. Most of the sample was male and as a group they demonstrated moderate restrictive lung function impairment with severe diffusion abnormality. Our analysis revealed that 25% of these patients could be classified as presenting low muscle mass, while the remaining 75% of the patients showed normal levels of muscle mass. These patients also performed the six-minute walking test, and we demonstrated that after adjustment for sex, age, and lung function parameters, the mean difference between these two groups is 76 meters, and this, finds, this find confirms that body composition is a factor independently associated with functional exercise capacity also in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Before I proceed to the conclusion, I would like to present the main results of a longitudinal study conducted using data from the ice age study performed at CIRO. Three groups were included in the study patients with COPD, smoking, and non-smoking controls. As expected, smoking and non-smoking controls 
presented preserved lung function. There was a higher proportion of women among the non-smoking controls. Patients with COPD were recruited on referral to pulmonary rehabilitation at zero during a clinically stable phase. The smoking and non-smoking controls were recruited from the same region. All these three groups came to the rehabilitation center and had their body composition assessed in a first visit. After two years of follow-up, these individuals came back and the assessment was repeated. Consequently, muscle mass and fat mass was measured during this time. Although there was a significant decline in muscle mass in patients with COPD and the smoking controls, no changes were observed in mus uh, muscle mass in the no smoking controls. Similarly, we found that the fat mass remained stable in non-smoking controls, while patients with COPD and smoking controls showed a significant increase in fat mass over this period. Interestingly, we could investigate in which region of the body this loss of muscle mass was occurring. We found that there was a significant decline in the lower limbs muscle mass of patients with COPD as well as in the trunk, lung, lung, trunk muscle mass. In contrast, no significant changes were observed considering the upper limbs. Based on these findings, we can conclude that body composition abnormalities are frequently present in individuals with chronic respiratory disease and are clinically relevant since they are associated with worse characteristics. Also, special attention should be given to detecting low muscle mass in overweight and obese patients, since sarcopenic obesity may present significant worse impact on clinical outcomes. And finally, patients with COPD and the smoking control present a significant decline in muscle mass in two years, and this decline was more pronounced in their lower limbs and trunks and trunk. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and now I give the work back to the proactor. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Wesseling, Professor of Respiratory Medicine at Maastricht University, and he was the chair of the assessment committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Paul Rector. Dear candidate, um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you for an excellent thesis. This is very nice research. It's uh, well written, it's a nice read, and it's yet another gem in the long string of beautiful research originating from CIRO. So uh, I also extend my congratulations to your supervisors. Um, and, and, and on top of that, you've got a, a long list of publications so early in your career, so that promises a lot for the next 40 years. Um, we look forward to that. I have a number of questions related to chapter six. Um, you just explained the uh, course of the uh, fat-free mass, or the, the muscle mass, in time in patients with COPD. Now, now, we know that many patients with COPD have comorbidities, and you've mentioned that. Uh, is, is there any idea from your research how these comorbidities uh, influence the course of the for instance, fat-free mass or muscle mass uh, decline in time in COPD? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question and also for the nice words. Um, that's an interesting question um, about uh, chapter six. And um, in chapter six, we discussed some previous studies that followed patients with COPD for some time and body composition was assessed during this time. And we don't have a lot of studies that perform that. Most of the studies investigating the association between body composition and functional outcomes or metabolic parameters are cross-sectional. And indeed, from all of the publication, as far as I remember, no one has included comorbidity as a, a factor that m could be associated with a more pronounced decline or more pronounced change in body composition. And this is something that we should investigate also, we should follow these patients for a longer period of time because these comorbidities, they, uh, they may happen 
earlier in the disease and we should act earlier during the management of COPD and its comorbidities. So this should be investigated and we wrote a specific paragraph in the discussion of this manuscript that we suggest that uh, more research with longer follow-up period should be performed in, over in the next few years to reveal if the role of each different factor and the change in body composition over time in patients with COPD but also in other chronic respiratory disease. Yeah, thank you. That sounds reasonable. Um, um, now these comorbidities might also influence activity, physical activity in these patients and my guess has always been that inactivity plays a role especially in, in uh, limb, lower limb uh, um, loss of muscle mass. Now there's a huge range of comorbidities that you've taken into account ranging from for instance diabetes to hypertension. Now some of these are likely to affect activity and others may not. Can you take that into account in such a, a follow-up study? Uh, yes, we can. We, uh, in our chapter 7, we use the data from the Cosiconet and this uh, manuscript is still uh, under review in the, in the final stages. And we could include a broad range of comorbidities varying, as you said, from diabetes to even uh, cardiac disease, um, metabolic syndrome. And in this co a cohort, I believe that we have longitudinal data. So in the next few years, maybe we can explore uh, the role and if there is an influence of each comorbidity on body composition. Because in chapter seven, we saw, for instance, that in overweight patients with COPD, those who have uh, chronic heart failure, they present this is associated with independently associated with a lower six minute walking distance and then probably this could be expanded to lower physical activity in daily living mm. so uh, yes the comorbidities may have different impact on both physical activity and body composition uh, and we should investigate this on a longitudinal perspective i believe thank you w one more question if i may yeah uh, You've taken the COPD patients together. Now there's quite some uh, differences in in the group of COPD patients. Uh, you have a, um, a range of diffusion capacity. Uh, I, I couldn't find much on exacerbation frequency. Is there is there something there? I mean, for instance, in, in diffusion capacity or exacerbation frequency that relates to the decline in lung fun in in the muscle mass. Um. Yes, for for we we already know that in cross section studies, patients with low muscle mass usually present also worse diffusion capacity. Uh, this is the, this is what we can observe in several cross section studies and also in the studies included in my thesis. Uh, but we don't know exactly what's happening uh, first or or. And uh, if the, these chains are associated on a, long, on, longitudinal, on a longitudinal perspective and about exacerbations, that's uh, something more uh, clear. There are some studies showing that patients that show exacerbations and mainly when this exacerbation requires a hospitalization, then this is associated with a uh, more pronounced decline. And and when the patient has uh, another um, re-hospitalization, then this decline, this decline is stable and the, the patient does not return to the levels of muscle mass pre-hospitalization. So that's this, these are uh, factors, uh, exacerbations uh, <laughs> and diffusion capacity that are associated and mainly is a sebaceous may be a cause of uh, the decline in muscle mass in these patients here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I give the word back to the Pro-Rector. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Marquez, Professor in Respiratory Physiotherapy at Aveiro University in Portugal.
We highly appreciate your participation to this academic ceremony, and Professor Marquez was also a member of the assessment committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Proretta. And for the opportunity of being here today, I would like to greet uh, my colleagues of the assessment committee, the supervisors team, the audience, and especially the candidate. I will start by congratulating you for the development of this high quality research. It's an amazing thesis, so well done, congratulations. So my first question um, to the candidate is um, around your chapter two. And you showed us today very, um, in a very nice way in your conclusions that we should be worried about the extremes, especially the sarcopenic and the sarcopenic obese clinically. It's also very interesting in your chapter two that the sarcopenic patients are also the patients that are more physically active. And my questions are exactly around that. How can they be more physically active, but they also have the worst clinical outcomes? So do you think that we should be targeting more physical capacity measures rather than physical activity measures. I would like to hear your thoughts about this uh, relationship. Yeah, highly esteemed opponent. Thank you very much for your question and also for the nice words. Uh, yeah, that's indeed an interesting topic because we, to answer properly this question, we have to understand the independent roles and also if is there is an interaction between physical activity and muscle mass and how this affects functional outcomes such as exercise capacity because a patient may present physical act uh, adequate physical activity levels but which which we know that this is uh, it's it's it's, it is well established that physical activity it's associated with exercise capacity, but then uh, low muscle mass, and then this is um, a balance. There, the positive advantage of being physically active may be counterbalanced by the negative uh, consequence of presenting low muscle mass. So, what we need to understand if physical activity if the effect of physical activity for the functional outcomes are the same for each of the patients with body composition with the different body composition phenotypes because one um, we also have studies that show that having more muscle mass it's also associated with better functional capacity but the question that remains is what's more important it's more important to be physically active or it's more important to be to have preserved muscle mass so this is something that we still I think it's not totally clear and we show that patients um, with sarcopenia they indeed present the highest the the best ex best uh, relatively preserved ex uh, physical activity but worse uh, six minutes walking distance yeah. for instance we our hypothesis is that malnutrition and energy intake it's uh, maybe the cause of sarcopenia or it's more related to sarcopenia in these patients and not physical activity physical activity per, per se we also have data from jones and colleagues and they stratified patients as patients with no impairment patients that only had low muscle mass patients with only low physical functioning in patients with the combination low muscle mass and low physical functioning and the patients with low muscle mass only they also had worse physical activity levels so even if you if the patient presents low muscle mass but is this still physically active there might be some adaptations in the muscle tissue that are that uh, present some advantage to exercise capacity and muscle strength because we know that there is a, a relationship between the amount of muscle mass and muscle strength, for instance, but muscle strength is not only explained by mus by the amount of muscle mass. There are also other difference in in muscle that may or the amount of units that someone can recruit to perform strength that can also explain 
difference in exercise capacity in muscle strength. Yeah. Very good. Yes. Yeah, sorry Makes for sense. The, the function. Response. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so I also noticed you use different cutoffs around your thesis to identify fat-free mass index abnormalities and that you use the 10th percent percentile between your chapter two and six, but you also use the cutoffs from the RS and the health ABC study, uh, or even uh, use the percentile 25th, if I'm not yes. mistaken, in your chapter seven. Yes. So basically, you use different criteria to identify these abnormalities, and I also would like, in a clinical perspective, uh, what are your thoughts and your recommendations? I know there are conflicts of, in the literature, but I would like to hear your thoughts about this. Uh, yes, we, there was a statement on uh, nutrition and in patient with COPD, and there is a recommendation of using the 10th percentile to, to determine um, low muscle mass in patients with COPD, since this is, has been shown in previous research and research studies, um, some of them conducted by enemies, Professor Souls, one of the professors of Maastricht University, and we most of the times use the 10th percentile, but you can also use the 5th percentile if you want to be more strict, if you want to, uh, to consider that low muscle mass is only if the patient is below 5% of the of the people from the general population, this is a little bit more strict, but the interpretation is the same. If you have a group of patients and you apply the 50 percentile and you find that 10% of the patients are below the 50 percentile, then you found the double, the double as expected the, the, in, in the prevalence of low muscle mass in these patients. If you apply the 10th percentile and you find that 20% of the patients have low muscle mass, then it's also, you would expect only 10% of the patients and 20% of them are showing this low level of muscle mass. So it's also, this also means that uh, the prevalence of the frequency of sarcopenia or of low muscle mass in these patients is double as expected. The most important information for clinical practice, I think it's to adjust the cutoffs for, for BMI, for instance, because uh, we have this year, we, there it was published the first uh, diagnosis criteria for sarcopenic obesity by the Aspen and EASO uh, society, the different societies, and they recommend that when you, when you are investigating low muscle mass in patients with overweight or low muscle mass, you should adapt, you should interpret low muscle mass in light of the the excess fat accumulation in these patients and also of the in light of the different instruments or equipment that you are using to assess body composition yeah thank you thank you very much so um with permission of uh, mr prorector i would just say a sentence i know uh, philippe's family is online so uh, the next sentence is for Felipe, but also for his family. Muitos parabéns a toda a família, esposa, amigos pelo homem, marido, amigo e cientista extraordinário que criaram. Após uma longa e muito sofrida jornada de tantas formas diferentes, valeu a pena. E hoje a festa é vossa também. Muitas felicidades. Thank you very much. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Hansen, Professor in Rehabilitation and Exercise Physiology and Cardiometabolic Diseases at Hasselt University. Professor Hansen was member of the assessment committee and we highly appreciate your participation today to this ceremony. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear Mr. Candidates, first allow me to congratulate you on this excellent piece of work. It was a marvelous thesis. And the problem is that you make it look like science is easy based on the number of publications, which is obviously not the case. And also, my sincere congratulations to your supervisors and co-supervisors. You did an excellent job. 
But of course, your work also sparked some interest. Um, and I would like to go to chapter six, the IHH study. That was the reason why I read that first, because of the title of the, of the, of the project. And what you showed in your study is that the fat-free mass changes during follow-up in the legs and trunk, but not in the arms. My hypothesis is, is that the incidence of sarcopenia is not driven by disease, but driven by physical activity. What is your response to that hypothesis? Um, that's a very good, sorry, highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your question. And thank you also for the nice compliments and words. Um, that's a good hypothesis. I, yeah, as I, in the previous answer for uh, Professor Alda, uh, we we strongly believe that physical activity and nutritional factors are uh, important determinants on, on the, pres the decline in muscle mass and and the, the consequently the frequency of low muscle mass in patients with chronic respiratory disease and one of our hypotheses and it's in accordance with yours is that uh, the activities of that usually demand the use of lower limbs are most of the times performed at a higher uh, work rate or a higher VO2. So there are some studies comparing the peak VO2 from uh, lower limbs um, incremental exercise tests and arm limbs exercise test and the VO2 f uh, from the same from the same from the same person that it's obtained in a uh, in a tests performed in an arm ergometer it's 30 percent approximately if i'm not wrong lower so most of the activities that are performed with the lower limbs mm -hmm. they they usually are are performed at a higher work and then for the patient with cpd this may induce some abnormalities and some uh, changes. It causes dyspnea. So the patient starts to avoid most of these activities, but with the activities with the limbs, they are done in a lower uh, intensity. And then the patient in also for self-care activities, also for activities like, uh, such as cooking or taking care of your of your body so the patient keeps doing these activities and for the lower limbs mm -hmm. activities such as running or such as climbing the stairs can be quite difficult for a patient with with chronic respiratory disease and with symptoms yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay and if, if i can go further in your explanation that would also mean that simply providing an exercise intervention would be able to counteract the instance of sarcopenia, or is this not true? Is this uh, to go to the board? Yes, we, we we have data that shows that the, the also from the study of Jones and colleagues that the presence of sarcopenia does not uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. The benefits of pulmonary rehabilitation are not hampered by sarcopenia. So a sarcopenic patient that under that performs or that undergo pulmonary rehabilitation, they still can uh, have the same benefits as patients with without sarcopenia. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a pulmonary rehabilitation can even in some patients um, reverse this syndrome, this, this disease, sarcopenia. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we can show that pulmonary rehabilitation, that it's mainly the, the most uh, one of the most important non-pharmacological components are, is exercise can can be a good uh, therapy for, for these patients. Mm -hmm. But we are now going further and there are also uh, studied, led by Professor Souls from Maastricht University. And we are now uh, getting more knowledge on how to personalize the management of sarcopenia in patients with COPD, for instance. And he, this is the title of one of his or her publications. Mm -hmm. And there you can see some different examples of approaches and 
interventions that could be useful mainly for patients with COPD who are sarcopenic. Mm -hmm. And do you also think that anabolic resistance is involved in the incidence of sarcopenia? And how, if it is involved, how would you counteract that in clinical practice? Yes, that's a more uh, physiological uh, question. And that's important because we know that the maintenance of muscle mass is it's given by a balance between protein synthesis and uh, and protein turnover or degradation mm -hmm. and patients with COPD uh, mainly cachetic patients with COPD they, it's known that they have a increased protein turnover mm -hmm. uh, turnover so and they also have uh, characteristics that are that uh, are in accordance with anabolic resistance so this should play a role and how to counteract this problem uh, as i remember from this publication exercise uh, resistance exercise is a one uh, good choice and also protein supplementation mm -hmm. there are also some uh, medications uh, that are being tested and anabolic steroids also for patients with severe sarcopenia or cachexia are also recommended uh, but in, indeed this is one of the challenges we have to uh, restore the balance between protein synthesis and and protein turnover in these patients to to s and we have to investigate how is the best way you're to do this or mm -hmm. how can we do this yes okay thank you very much i would like to give the word back to the prorector Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Jonkers, Professor of Intestinal Health at the Maastricht University. Professor Jonkers was member of the assessment committee and she is the secretary of the degree committee. Thank you very much. I also would like to congratulate you and your supervisory team in a very interesting thesis. I did read it with great uh, pleasure. I think you really did a lot of work with uh, handling all the data from all those impressive studies, and I think it's a very beautiful example, again, of the fruitful collaboration with C.O. Horn and the nice work being done there. Uh, and I would like to follow up a little bit on my uh, the previous uh, opponent uh, and uh, zoom in a bit further on uh, the cause of the low fat-free mass you find in COPD, which is found in a substantial number of patients there. We already discussed the low physical activity, so I will leave that out. And I would like to go a little bit further into the disease-specific effects. And uh, as you also indicated in your introduction, uh, there's also systemic inflammation. And I was also very happy with chapter seven, where you included some inflammatory markers uh, there. So uh, how important is this role of inflammation? What are your thoughts about that? Uh, yes, thank, a highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, we in, indeed, in my introduction in chapter one, I, I state in one of the topics, why to measure body composition in patients with COPD, and then I mentioned that smoking may be one of the causes because I, we we see that smoking is related with um, mu muscle and fat dysfunction, dis disarrangement, and systemic inflammation also. We investigated in chapter seven, was the only chapter that we had the opportunity to include inflammatory markers in our analysis and what is established right uh, at this moment is that uh, patients with increased fat mass they had an increased low-grade systemic inflammation and we I, I, I already know from other studies that these inflammatory markers for instance EL6 they are uh, link it to insulin resistance, for instance, and then this is also insulin, one of the hormones that uh, provides an anabolic effect on our on our bodies. So, systemic inflammation may be linked, for instance, by causing 
were being a source of um, impairment in the in 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 insulin resistance but also in other uh, pathways of protein synthesis and and also inducing anabolic resistance yeah, that was uh, exactly what i wanted to 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 know <laughs> yeah, because you talked in uh, in the previous answer on on uh, protein uh, yeah. uh, breakdown or synthesis uh, uh, do you think that the cytokines, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, can directly have an effect on your muscle mass? And how would that then work? What do you think is the effect? Yes, I have, I have been reading about uh, the inter-organ crosstalk and how the adipose, the adipose tissue and the muscle mass, they talk to each other and mm -hmm. they they may have an effect in, on each other and since since some time muscle mass is not more seen as only a tissue that makes movement or that contracts it's also s uh, has been seen over in the last years as an organ as a yeah. tissue that also has myokines for instance mm -hmm. uh, so they they have interconnections and I believe that the adipokines and the, the pro-inflammatory adipokines, they are released in our body and they may have a systemic effect and they also may have an impact mm. on skeletal muscle tissue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree with you with that also the cytokines can have an, an impact and that this can be a disease impact. And maybe also therefore I have a short question on your inclusion criterion because for example, you said that those only those with an exacerbation in the last month were excluded. And I was just wondering, but I come a little bit from the field of inflammatory bowel disease, which is also chronic inflammation. And if we exclude just exacerbation in the last month, that is not long enough because then we still see some cytokines in the systemic circulation. So I was wondering why did you choose for excluding those only with an exacerbation in the last month? And is that was that long enough, given the fact that potentially cytokines can play a role? Uh, yes, uh, to give a proper answer to this question, I would have to go back in literature and check uh, in more details. Uh, the time maybe to these inflammatory markers after an exacerbation, because we know that they have an increase mm -hmm. during an exacerbation. And how many how many time does these inflammatory markers take to uh, restore to the normal levels uh, and only then i would okay. be able to provide a uh, okay. more yeah. correct answer yeah. Yeah. okay thank you. can i ask one last uh, question because i already mentioned i'm very interested in the topic and actually reading your thesis i was very convinced that it's also very relevant in chronic in, uh, inflammatory bowel disease to check for this low fat-free mass uh, index and i was wondering if you could advise me then what technique to use because you used uh, the low fat-free mass index but also the appendicular uh, uh, muscle mass index, uh, but also the uh, the face angle, and you sometimes find uh, find uh, more higher sensitivities for some of the um, biomarks. So, yes. can you give me uh, quite short advice on what to use in patients with chronic intestinal inflammation to get further insight there? Yes, uh, the the last consensus from the European Working Group of, on sarcopenia and other people, uh, they, they state that all of the different techniques to assess body composition, they have their limitations, but, but the DEXA scan may be considered a reference standard, not, not the gold standard that would be an MRI or CT scan, but they they can be considered in the reference um, standard but they also suggest the biological impedance analysis can be used uh, but this will depend most often on the uh, resources from from for your research or that you have in your clinical practice because the DEXA scan is more expensive 
it's not portable so also if you want to assess many patients such as we did in our chapter 7 more than 2000 patients mm -hmm. then all of the 31 centers in Germany should have the same uh, DEXA scan device and that is um, yeah, expensive and mm. it, this technique also requires training but if you if you can use DEXA scan, then appendicular skeletal muscle index is an interesting variable to use. And now we have reference values from Offenheimer and colleagues. And these reference values are also adjusted for BMI. So if you have an obese or overweight patients with, with uh, any other disease, cardiac disease or mm -hmm. inflammatory uh, disease, COPD, they, you can use these values and compare to the percentiles from the general population because the uh, appendicular skeletal muscle index yeah. it's the lean mass of the limbs and this is basically skeletal muscle tissue okay thank you very much you really convinced me that it's worth looking to the DEXA <laughs> for that thank you very much the opposition will be continued by Professor Black, Professor in Human Biology at the Maastricht University, and she was also a member of the assessment committee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prorector, dear candidate. Uh, also, I would like to congratulate you very much, you and your supervisors, with this very nice piece of work. I read it with great pleasure. I think it's very well written and, uh, of course, offers a lot of leads for discussion. Um, at first, I would like to, to come back a little bit to the reference values uh, and that has uh, already been discussed, but I'm also a little bit confused by the different reference values uh, that are used. And, uh, of course, body uh, composition phenotypes may uh, be the basis for more targeted intervention, so it may be quite uh, important. What I was wondering, uh, uh, you uh, also use uh, population reference values, uh, working with percentiles, uh, and we know, of course, that the prevalence of overweight and obesity is increasing worldwide in most countries of the world uh, by, by two to three-fold since 1980. So to what extent is it still valid to use population reference values for fat mass index, but also fat-free mass may, may increase, or body mass index? Can you comment on it? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question and also for the nice words. Uh, yes, uh, the, there are some uh, statistical approaches or some ways of that we can use to determine if uh, body composition or any other variable such as exercise capacity is normal or abnormal one of these approaches is to use to collect this data in people which we consider that are somehow healthy and that that's what we we that's what have been done uh, we have used reference values uh, from the uk biobank for from uh, established by bilateral impedance analysis, but also for, uh, reference values uh, developed on using the DEXA scan. And I believe that if you if you have high quality studies that are collecting this data and are establishing the curves or uh, establishing reference values, this will uh, for 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 the, the present moment be suitable to classify the patients as presenting low or normal muscle mass but we what a different approach is try try to find using for instance rock curve analysis uh, what what are the the cutoff for 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 instance appendicular skeletal muscle index that can discriminate patients with maybe lower or higher exercise capacity or uh, that are at a higher increased or lower risk of mortality this can also be done so there are some different approaches but using reference values are also uh, this is an approach that is also used for instance for the six minute walking tests for exercise capacity for the CPAT uh, so 
that's also a, a good strategy to use. Okay, thank you. So you would like to relate it uh, also to the functional outcome or that has been done in, uh, in several studies, uh, I understand, on the population-based studies. Uh, sorry, can you, can you to relate it more to functional outcomes, uh, also uh, your curves of uh, of body mass index or fat free mass index or fat mass index. Uh, we, we we have some cutoffs that were developed using for for in, for instance mortality. So the first cutoffs that were presented f for for the scientific community, they were uh, based on. Uh, a higher risk of mortality. So before, uh, for instance, the the cutoff 17 for male and 16 for female, for instance, as a cutoff for the fat-free mass index was used because patients with any fat-free mass, any value of fat-free mass index lower than that were at an increased risk of death. So this can also be done, for instance, in our chapter seven, if we have longitudinal data and if we follow the patients uh, with different body composition in the different BMIs and body mass index, and if we see that there is different immortality between these groups, then we can try to validate these cutoffs and show that they are derived, derived from the general population and they are associated with mortality. So we have two uh, uh, to different informations that supports you to use the this these values. Okay, thank you, clear. And I would like to go uh, now somewhat into physiology also uh, with you. Uh, a very interesting finding uh, is also that the prevalence of low fat-free mass index is higher in males with COPD as compared to females. And you elaborate uh, on that a little bit also in your discussion that it may be related, for instance, to sex hormones. Um, but could there also be other explanations? What is your view on that? What, uh, uh, yes, the, there's an, uh, one hypothesis. So we, we have some studies investigating the frequency or the prevalence of hi hi hypogonadism in, in patients with COPD. So this is a problem that the, the gonads that usually produce the male the sex yeah testosterone and other androgenic uh, hormones are not functioning very well uh, this could be one hypothesis but also there are we need to understand if there are not any uh, sex or gender related differences in the progression of body composition because in and there is at least one study that I remember now. That I mentioned this study uh, somewhere in my thesis that they followed more than 6,000 uh, people for approximately 10 years. And there was a sh uh, more pronounced decline in physical activity and muscle mass in male compared to uh, female. So that could be also another difference that with aging, male uh, patients with COPD, they show uh, a more pronounced decline in, in any other factor that is related to body composition. And then that's the, the problem. Yeah. Yes, uh, very interesting. That also could be important. And uh, thinking, uh, for instance, about cardiometabolic risk profile, which may be quite different between males and females, also uh, in aging males and females, uh, relating to factors like inflammation that has been touched upon or adipose tissue function. Can you think of, of several explanations related also to inter-organ crosstalk that may be different between males and females? Yeah, I'm afraid that uh, that I cannot uh, go too deep into uh, sex-related difference in the physiology of uh, lipolysis or muscle mass um, loss. But I, uh, in uh, in our chapter six, for instance, we recommend that f uh, studies that. Um, Future studies with a longer period of follow-up should uh, check if there are different 
body composition trajectories in patients with COPD because we know that they have different lung function trajectories, for instance, but they may also have different body composition trajectories and we should investigate if the factors that are associated with this trajectory are different between male and f uh, female patients because we, this is this may be the case but we don't have any data until this moment showing this okay thank you uh, i fully agree that it would be very interesting to study that and i give the word uh, back to the prorector thank you the opposition will be continued by dr simons respiratory physician at the maastricht university medical center Thank you, Mr. Prorector, uh, dear Mr. Candidate. Uh, I too also want to begin by offering my congratulations to you for this excellent thesis and through you um, also my compliments to your supervisors and your family. Um, well, I thoroughly enjoyed reading this thesis and gave me a lot of new insights in the uh, uh, low free fat mass in COPD. Uh, I wanted to touch upon one of the statements you made earlier on about exacerbations. So you stated that um, exacerbations might also drive muscle loss. And I would like you to, to go back to uh, your chapter six, if you may. So where you uh, looked into the longitudinal uh, aspects of uh, loss of free muscle mass. And I was happy to see that you included exacerbations. But then if I read correctly at page 110, you state there were no associations between longitudinal changes in body composition and number of exacerbations during follow-up. So I just wondered if you could help me understand this difference and your f first statement. Yes, um, in this study in particular, uh, esteemed opponent, thank you for your question and also for the compliment. And um, yeah, for the for this particular study, we use a stepwise regression analysis, and then you have to insert some variables, and the model will choose on a stepwise procedure which one are, which variables are strongly related with your outcome. And we inserted as variables the number of exacerbations and the number of hospitalizations. So these were two different variables, and the the result was that hospitalizations are uh, associated with a more pronounced decline in pseudograde markers of muscle mass but not exacerbations but this is because hospitalizations was the the, uh, the the strongest variable the variable which was more strongly related with the with the the change in muscle mass so it, in table three of this manuscript, we see the multiple linear regression and we see the effect of a previous hospitalization on on the decline of on fat of fat free mass index. And exacerbations may cause hospitalizations or the, the so that's that we you can see a link in this um, if if we see from this perspective. Yeah. But if I was correct, that was the from baseline and not from follow-up. Am I correct? During, during the, 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 the previous hospitalization? Oh, yes, previously, yes. So, yes. and, and uh, my question was regarding during the follow-up. Yes, yes, the, 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 was the, uh, as I said, the number of hospitalizations and exacerbations in the previous year. Yeah, yeah. you were correct. And during follow-up, you state also hospitalizations were not associated with loss of free muscle mass so yes. i just wondered what's the, the idea behind that yes mm, yeah in this study the exacerbations in the previous year we year were more important than during the 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 follow-up period and maybe that's the the center of your question the central topic of, of your question and maybe we didn't had enough time to see the effect of this this exacerbation during these two years, because if the patient had an exacerbation uh, after seventeen months, then maybe we could not detect the the effect of this exacerbation in 
than two years. But if the patient had an exacerbation the preview is in the previous year, maybe that's a possible explanation. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Felipe Villaja Cavallari Machado, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of, of our deliberations and our return to this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the Skills Lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their change semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real-life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Camelot campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project that includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. 
In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time around, but you get used to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while. Felipe Villaja Cavalleri Machado, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Spratt is authorized to confirm upon you this academic distinction in accordance with the Dutch University custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? To be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us 
by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Felipe Vilasa Cavallari Machado, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Caro Doutor Machado, dear Felipe, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate you uh, also on behalf of Professors Bruit and Professor Pita. Esto molto orgullosa de sua conquista. I hope you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> <coughs> ah, Fabio is smiling. Here. You studied physiotherapy at the University of Londrina in Brazil. You then obtained a master's degree in rehabilitation sciences at the same university in 2018. At the beginning of that year, you came to zero for your master thesis for three months. And there your plan for a PhD project on body composition in chronic lung diseases slowly took shape. In February 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were able to appoint you at Maastricht University within the Ericosismet project, and since then you've been working very energetically, which has resulted in a thesis that we have discussed in, in the last hour. The Department of Respiratory Diseases of Maastricht University and CIRO have a long tradition of research into body composition in chronic lung diseases, in particular COPD. Low body weight was one of the first described extrapulmonary features in this disease, and as early as the 90s, Maastricht researchers showed that low, low fat-free mass as a measure for muscle mass is associated with reduced functioning, low quality of life, and even increased risk of death in COPD. Your research builds beautifully on this tradition and has yielded important new insights. For example, you have shown that having a low muscle mass has less adverse effects in obese COPD patients because the excess of fat mass has already negative consequences. You have also shown that a decrease in fat-free mass mainly occurs in patients who initially still have enough of this and in patients with severe lung attacks in the past. This suggests that we should target these patients early on to prevent deterioration and this is easily translatable into daily practice. Your work to date has resulted in four pre-reviewed and published papers as a first author. One manuscript in the final stage of revision and another one ready for submission. One of your articles in Respirology was accompanied by an editorial that further emphasized the relevance of your work and called upon the world to, to come up with better strategies to, to prevent muscle loss in COPD. I think this is a very nice acknowledgement of your work. In addition, and this is really admirable, you, com you have co-authored 23 other pa papers in the last years, many in the field of COVID-19, but also in other chronic lung diseases. So of course you deserve all credits for the complementation of your thesis. You could, you, you could not have done it without the help of many others. So I would like to thank a number of people First of all, Zon M. Mwee, the provider for the funding in the Netherlands. Without financial support from the Irakosismet project uh, program, it would not have been possible for you to do a PhD in the Netherlands. In addition, I'd like to thank the many researchers, patients, nurses, and doctors who have taken and undergone measurements within the various cohorts that you have analyzed from Brazil, Germany, and the Netherlands. Thanks to the fruitful and pleasant collaboration with Professor Pita of the University of Londrina in Brazil, from which so many impactful studies have already emerged. I would like to thank the members of the promotion committee for the assessment of the thesis and their presence here today. In particular, Professor Marques 
from the University of Alvero, who, like our own group in Maastricht, is an international advocate for innovative non-drug-related treatments in patients with COPD. I would also like to include your parents, Antonio and Wilza, and your sister Marina, in my congratulations. It must be not always easy for you that Felipe is so far away. I hope you can hold him in your arms one day soon again. Also, my congratulations to your wife, Bruna, also for your birthday. <laughs> Will you describe yourself as your, your constant support and best partner ever? I trust you that this is true, and I wish you all the best for the future together. Felipe. Over the last year, I have come to know you as a hardworking, enthusiastic researcher who is very eager to learn. You are very collegial and you can run quite well. You have a lot of innovative ideas and you are able to con convert them into concrete research. Moreover, you are a good scientific writer and you make very beautiful presentations as we have seen today. In short, you possess all the qualities you need as a researcher. You will continue your career as a postdoctoral assistant in the rehabilitation sciences and physiotherapy at the University of Hasselt. I'm confident that this will be a great success. Since Hasselt is not too far from here, I hope we can do some more research together as well. But not today, because now it's time for a drink. Enjoy the moment. Dear Dr. Machado, dear Felipe, also on behalf of the Maastricht University, I will congratulate you with this degree of doctor. It's already mentioned by your supervisor, you are now moving to Hasselt. Uh, we wish you all the best in your future academic career. Hasselt is not far away from Maastricht, it's already mentioned, but Hasselt is also not far away from Leuven, and I'm sure there will be an appointment and a meeting with your co-supervisor uh, in Leuven in the next future. So, all the best for the future. Uh, I will now close this session. I will ask the public to leave the room. We are uh, and going to the reception area. But before, we will first make a, a picture on the stairs in the main hall with a new doctor. I close this ceremony.